Yeah, welcome to the podcast, Brad. Um, Brad Kreil, for our viewers, is a robotics engineer like myself and an entrepreneur. Uh, he's got a couple of ventures going right now that I know of, and I'm sure a few that I don't. Uh, Brad, welcome here. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you, Spencer. You're welcome. So I guess, yeah, thank you. Um, my pleasure. <laughs> so I guess to, to get back <laughs> into it, um, I, I wanted to sort of talk today about well, whatever we want, but just to kind of get us started, uh, I feel like your entrepreneurial experience is probably going to be really interesting to our viewers. So typically, uh, at least for the interviews we've done so far, it's been what we've had on people talking about engineering and like some of the media aspects of what we do. And so I think it'd be fun to get into, uh, I don't know, entrepreneurship, what it takes to start a company, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then, I don't know, I mean, we could talk about the work we've both done in mining. There's there's a few ways we could take this. So, I don't know, whatever you think is natural. Cool. Yeah, no, let's, let's, uh, let's get into it. Yeah, I'm fine talking about either one of those. Uh, entrepreneurship is certainly something that I've been doing for the past, what, seven, eight years. And uh, I guess you could even say that even before that, in my time at Caterpillar, I, uh, I tried a little entrepreneurship and I've certainly got some takes on that as well. Nice. I'd be interested to hear about that. So what was it like? Uh, so, as you know, I worked at Joy Mining, which was a competitor to Cat, and it was pretty much as corporate as it gets in terms of where I've worked. Uh, I mean, it, granted, you know, I, I, most of my career I've spent, you know, kind of working for SKA and this sort of, you know, self set up environment. But I, uh, in terms of companies, I've only worked for SpaceX, Joy, and uh, an advertising company called Deep Local. Joy by far was, was very corporate. I'd imagine Cat was similar, I guess. What was, what was your experience there? Yeah, so you, your three that you listed there are, that's, that's a really interesting combo. <laughs> I did not know about Deep Local, by the way. Um, oh, yeah, I guess I never mentioned it. That's, yeah. <laughs> I bet those three were very, very different. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I yeah. kind of did that on purpose. I wanted to get sort of a different perspective of, of like what different parts of industry, you know, use to solve the same problems. And it, it definitely got the result. I uh, had some <laughs> diversity there, so thank you. Yeah, okay. So uh, I guess I got really deep into, uh, into Megacorp because I was a Caterpillar uh, short, uh, after a very, very brief stint um, in another uh, big oil and gas company, um, I was at Caterpillar for nearly 10 years. Oh, wow. And Nobody does that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was I was there for, for long enough to, to get a good taste, right? <laughs> nice. Uh, and also, very corporate. Um, you know, I, I think that I can only speak to my experience, but with, with Caterpillar, Caterpillar is really good at what it does. You know, it's, oh, absolutely. And it's been built around, has an amazing brand um, built around, you know, delivering big yellow machines to big burly guys who run them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys and, had some uh, great blocking devices too that made our lives more difficult than joy, which again, I'm always applaud that because it was a brilliant strategic move. Uh, so, so with, with cat and, and I think with other uh, big companies that have had a lot of success over in, in Caterpillar's case, over a hundred years, um, no, not over a hundred years, but over 80 years. And in the case of, in, in I, I think in every case, the, the more success you have at doing that and kind of the more infrastructure you have in place to support that, the harder it is to innovate and um, kind of think outside that box because that box has gotten you to where you are. And so that was, that was kind of a struggle for me at Caterpillar because I was developing new tech um, and, you know, there was just a lot of internal conflict between, you know, what tech we should, obviously what tech should be developed, but who should develop it? Should it be internal, external? You know, all of those like kind of existential questions for a, an R&D group. Um, <laughs> and, you know, here we were in an R&D group and then there were, you know, 
very like basic questions being asked. Yeah. And so then, you know, you kind of wonder, well, gosh, you know, should the R and D group exist? It, you know, is, is that even something that the Caterpillar really wants to support? I don't know. <laughs> Did you ever get like, we've been doing that it that way for like 50 years as a reason, like why to make a decision. Cause I feel like people would use that one oh. to enjoy a decent amount. Yeah, of course, of course. And you know, it totally depends on the business unit and you know, that infrastructure that I talked about really, um, that shows itself as corporate hierarchy as, you know, as the like business unit organization of the company. Yeah. And what's interesting, and there have been some pretty major changes since I left. And so uh, I think maybe some of those existential questions have been tackled a little, you know, more thoroughly than, you know, when I was there. But uh, the it, it, the business unit that you're in and what tech that business unit is driving um, is it, it varies very widely from business unit to business unit as well. So it's just big, you know, you've got over a hundred thousand employees. Jeez, yeah, and, that, is, that is massive. I mean, imagine yeah. having a slow sales year and having to feed a hundred thousand employees and their families. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, then in a cyclical, and I mean, I think most markets are cyclical and that certainly is no exception. Oh, and it's so like that, one of the most cyclical think, markets that exists. <laughs> My limited yeah, knowledge yeah. from the time I worked in it. Yeah, for sure. And you see layoffs happen you know in that cycle and that's just kind of what it is but interesting thing about caterpillar is that they really put a huge emphasis on uh on their employees and valuing their employees and it's awesome that had pros and cons but one of the pros is that when you do layoffs lots of times they're temporary and nice so yeah you uh you're just getting some unpaid time off or part paid time off that's and, good. Uh, I mean, you yeah, know, it's like, yeah. hey, this isn't personal, but it has to happen. Are you, you know, open to coming back? You know, once once we get over this hump, I really like that approach. Right. It. As you know, I'm also a small business owner. I mean, SKA you know, Engineering and Design Consulting Company. Um, it definitely feels like a baby. I mean, it feels like like something that, you know, I have a lot of emotional stake in how it does. Um, I, I want it to succeed. It's it's my dream job, you know. I mean, if, if the business is doing well, I feel like I'm doing well. Um, and if it's doing poorly, the same is true. Uh, how, how does uh, I guess Velocity, you know, robotics and, and running that company, and and bringing that company up to speed, and and some of your other ventures like SB Monitoring, how does that uh, impact your life and your interplay with those companies? <laughs> In every way. I mean, <laughs> it. Uh, I think, I think most, I don't know, this is a total guess. I have no idea if this is the case, but I would, I would guess that most people, um, kind of have their identity tied to their careers in a lot of ways. Um, I can see that. I've read, it seems logical that that happens. Um, I think with entrepreneurs, that's probably even more the case. And I know for me, my identity certainly is tied up and into what I do. And I think there's a, there's a mindset that you, you have to take this has kind of been part of my journey, especially over the past couple of years, because Velocity Robotics um, has had its, you know, serious financial struggles. In fact, right now it's on ice because, you know, no. we're, we don't have the funding to, to keep development going. And so that's, that's on ice and, uh, you know, maybe we'll come back to it. Maybe we won't. And even with SB monitoring, you know, one of the struggles of getting a new business off the ground is yes, bringing revenue in and, you know, we've shown ourselves capable of that, Excellent. but then it's also having enough positive cash flow to actually pay yourselves and, you know, pay the bills and, and all of those things, which the tricky turns part. out that's a whole, like, that's like the next level. Oh, of course. And, <laughs> and so, you know, as we've had our struggles with these things and, you know, technical problems and you know, this and that, whatever, um, I've 
you know, I've been in certain situations where I've really beat myself up over, well, you know, you, you know, you can't figure this out. You must be a horrible human being. Or it's really not. I mean, that's kind of melodramatic, but it's. No, no, no uh, but I, I know the feeling. I mean, I, I can identify yeah. a lot. I, I think when things aren't going well from a work perspective, um, you know, whether it's my fault or not, I feel like I lack purpose or, or sort of a reason for being sometimes. But when they're going yeah. well, like when we're in the flow of, you know, like the big project or two, or, you know, we just got paid or like, you know, we made enough that I was lucky enough to be able to pay myself, which, you know, happens less often than people would think. I think if you're, if you're a career <laughs> human, you know, I, I don't know. It's highly tied to my self-worth and, and my, uh, my sense of, uh, you know, you know, am I, am I fulfilling my purpose in this world and, and all that stuff? So I, I can identify with that. Yeah. It's so tough. Yeah. Very existential stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think for me, I've had to, I've had to let a lot of assumptions go assumptions about what an entrepreneur is assumptions about what a good salute, what a good solution looks like and have, <clears throat> um, have had to make peace with making some decisions that at first glance seem, um, either counterintuitive or counter to my whole counter to entrepreneurship or, you know, whatever, like <clears throat> just find ways to pay the bills. And, you know, there, there have been times when I've just had to find ways to pay the bills and that's it, you know? So, um, what, what I've realized is that those times, those pivots or micro pivots or, you know, whatever word you want to use to describe that, uh, those are steps. Those are steps along the journey. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, um, <clears throat> it's, it's not even, it's not even a sidestep. It's not, it's not going backwards. It's not like whatever. It's just, it's just a step on the path to the solution of whatever problem you're, you're working to solve. Yeah. I, I by the way, just talking to you, it's, it's really clear that you've been at this, like, and by this, I mean, entrepreneurship for a while, mm -hmm. because, you're much more mature than like a lot of the people I talk to who have like startup companies about it. I, I think your honesty really comes through here and like, you're not only honest with yourself, but I mean, you're honest with me, you're, you're putting this out there and not everybody I think has the, um, the lack of ego, you know, to be able to just, you know, say exactly what's going on and get the heart of it. But the people I know that do seem to do really, really, really well because they're much quicker to react when something is not going, which it always is, by the way, right? or like, I don't know. I mean, I, I noticed like, at least when I was getting started, I was so afraid to show any kind of weakness, you know, it's like, like the British soldiers, you know, back in the day wearing red, so you couldn't see when they were bleeding, you know, or whatever. And I feel like, like I'm getting better about it. Right. So like at this point, I think I'm a little bit more honest too, but like, I'm kind of envious of where you're at because you're so, up front and it's it's got to be conducive to like a, a smoother experience and you know less of that dissonance we were talking about so i would say that that's actually one of the key lessons learned and i wouldn't i, I mean you call it maybe transparency um I, okay transparency is a, i suppose a good word for it um i think that's tied in to setting realistic expectations too and I also think that self-transparency is important. Um, Absolutely. If you're, if you can be transparent, like if, what, what has gotten me into a lot of trouble is the opposite of that <laughs> is capacity, <laughs> if you will. Yep. And uh, uh, what, what happened, and this is a specific example from cat, from not from cat, from, uh, from velocity robotics. Um, I so badly, wanted to be at the next step or really, really probably more like five steps from now that I convinced myself that I was already there. And, uh, you know, so I was, you know, developing a very early prototype, but in my head, I was building product. Okay. I see. And those are, two very different stages. It requires different approaches. It requires different uh, resources, different skill sets, everything. It's totally different. Yeah. And 
So when you're, but the way that I communicated to every, every stakeholder, shareholders, uh, advisors, employees, partners, everybody. Probably is, yourself as well. And, and myself as well is five steps from now. And so then what happened was we didn't progress at all. We were stuck in this huh. phase right here and never got over here. And it was, um, it was really disappointing because we never hit any dates. Uh, we never, and you know, any expectation that I had, you know, that I gave to somebody else, even if I put padding on it, it didn't matter because we weren't progressing at all. And I was communicating progress because I wasn't lying. No, of I, course. I mean, I was, I had lied, I had lied enough to myself or had convinced myself that I was over there. And so then all sorts of pain happened. You know, I couldn't deliver product to customers and the customers were mad, obviously, um, as they should have been. Um, shareholders were mad, you know, I was frustrated. It was, it was just a cycle of pain. And so I think, uh, I, I don't know if I've, overcorrected or whatever, but I do feel like that is a big lesson learned that transparency is something that is really important. It's really critical. I, and I, I think you're right. It is, it is critical to making quick decisions and uh, acting quickly. I think I'm actually not as fast at making decisions and reacting and even being ahead of things and being proactive as I was, as I would like, you know, I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, admitting that right. and working in that direction, like I, I try to do that too, is, you know, I, I take whatever I perceive to be a weakness and I try to make it into a strength. I'm constantly doing that and trying to hone different parts of my personality and my acumen. So when you were talking, by the way, about, about that, that sort of, I don't know what to call it, but I guess that dissonance of, of, you know, you know, we're, we're here, but you know, we, we want to be here. So, so let's pretend we're here and maybe it'll come true. I'm reminded of uh, a product that we were working on internally. I'm not going to say which one just yet because I'm not ready to, I think, on the air. But uh, we pumped a lot of resources into it last year, uh, like like a good amount of money, uh, proportionately more than I would pump in in retrospect. And I remember feeling a lot of the time kind of like Captain Ahab from Moby Dick, you know, where you forget why you set out on this journey, but you got to complete this journey. And, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what the cost is, you know, and, and just it, I was doing things I advise SK's clients against on a regular basis. And so, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, and, and, you know, I just it just felt silly. Like, I mean, it, it didn't it wasn't a good feeling. It was incredibly painful. Uh, I, I knew on some part of my brain I was making poor decisions, but I, the, my ego wouldn't let me admit it. And so I, I kept making expensive, you know non-strategically bounded decisions and yeah it wasn't a good feeling um i hope i don't fall back into it at some point in my i'm sure i will you know in a limited capacity on something but it, it's interesting and you know? it feels good just coming out and saying it right now because you know that's not something i think i would have admitted to like a year ago so yeah yeah uh, well they say it's a journey you know and i always thought that was kind of fluffy but uh probably is but i like that's how i describe my experience as an entrepreneur now like that's pretty much the only way i describe it because it really is it's a huge huge learning experience where you have to constantly you have to constantly intentionally learn and improve i agree and, i mean i think by the way that's probably true you know Otherwise, you know, in, well, in other careers as well, it's just not as obvious and you can get by without doing that. Yeah, that's what but I was going to say. That, but if you're serious about, yeah. you know, your job and your identity, as you put it in that role, then you're going to progress and learn and probably get promotions. You can coast, I think, in, in larger companies, like we mentioned, because you just might not get noticed, you know, if you're, if you're wasting resources, you know, and you're kind of stagnant, or if you're, you're just good at a, a specific function and, and the function doesn't get, you know, obsoleted out, you know, but you know, it doesn't require growth. I think you can do okay. Uh, I'm speculating because I've never been in one of those functions that always sort of worked in R and D, but um, 
I don't know. It, it seems like that's a real thing, right? I mean, you talk to, I hate to say it, but like, you know, there's that, that old adage about the, the DOT equilibrium, like the Department of Transportation, where there's one person working and two people watching, you know? And so I feel like, I feel like that, that exists, but it, it, it isn't as common in the tech space, I think, as some other industries. Even at, yeah, even in R&D at CAT, we had our coasters. You know, it was, um, there were definitely people who just weren't contributing or weren't contributing well. And uh, going back to that, you know, I said earlier that CAT really values its employees. Well, yeah. that is true. One of the, so, that, you know, that sounds great. You know, that would look great on a recruitment poster, but... And, it, you know, and any, you know, corporate, <laughs> any corporate, anything, any corporate communication. Right. But the downside of that is actually they value their employees so much that they won't like they refuse to fire people for cause like, oh, no, <laughs> for or just like they'll fire people for stupid, like rule violations and things, oh. but they won't. <laughs> They won't fire people for, you know, for actually being idiots. I, that was and kind so... of funny. It's interesting <laughs> you mentioned it because I'm sure that results in a, in a great deal of bloat. And, and I observed similar things at, at Joy. I mean, the division I worked for was surface mining. So there were separate R&D groups for underground mining and surface mining. I think you mentioned at CAD it was structured under one group for R&D for both. But I, I was, I was uh, R&D advanced automation specifically under surface mining. And that office was located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which, as you probably know, has a huge drinking culture. Like it's, I mean, Milwaukee is on. If they had one thing on the map, it would be probably beer and cheese. That's that's two things. But <laughs> drinking, that's like maybe Summerfest. But they're known for, for drinking. And I remember, there was a day they did a pop up drug test, but it included a blood alcohol content. And there was a guy that came in that was still drunk from the night before, but had performed his job functions fine. And they fired that guy. But then there were other guys that just, you know, they would, I don't know, they just weren't pulling their weight, you know. And, and you know, as long as you don't swear or drink or put your feet on a desk, you're fine. I mean, you know. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the decision I would make at this point in my career, but, you know, I suppose they have their reasons. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's a cultural thing. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a corporate cultural thing, but it's, it's also, I think, you know, big companies have a tendency to be pretty conservative, you know, and the, the reason for that is I think they just carry a lot of, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, inertia, right? A lot of cultural inertia. And, you know, you have 100,000 people and, you know, that kind of, that kind of happens. And you have, you know, a lot of those 100,000 people are, co well, the vast majority of those are are career employees, right? Oh yeah, um, especially at those those and, old conservative companies. I mean, that's like one of the few last fashions of that. Right. Yeah. And and you know they went and they became a company person, and that was, um, you know, they they rely on that company to be their provider, right? Yeah. And uh, and and they. Those, there's probably a lot of overlap between that type of personality and the type of personality who's pretty conservative and, um, you know, socially conservative anyway. And sure. I, I don't know. I think that's, I you know think there's a risk why. aversion inherent in that, in that approach to, to careerism. And uh, I don't think there's anything right. wrong with it if, they, if that's how you're wired and that's, you know, what you want to come from. I mean, in fact, in a lot of ways, that kind of loyalty to, to a company is admirable. And I mean, you know, I, I want to work with those people because their training overhead goes way down and, you know, you can build lasting relationships and, and that's always important in business. But on the other hand, I, I think inertia is such a good word for it. You know, like that's I, I've never thought of that word to describe a, a company culture's kind of staying power, but it, it fits perfectly. I mean, you've got those people sticking around and that's what defines it. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting analysis. I never thought about it quite that way. We had, um, you know, anniversaries, we celebrated anniversaries at, at cat and, you know, every five years you would get a pin and 
you know, we would have celebrations where, you know, they have pins handed out and that sort of thing. And especially the bigger pins, like the, 25. the 15, 20, 25 year pins, the, they were kind of big deals. And, you know, you, you pulled all the, all the group into a, a big break room or into the cafeteria and you had cake and you, you know, handed out the thing and everybody kind of half-heartedly cheered and whatever. And those, <laughs> those... Sorry, just uh, thinking of a lot of different associations right now. The scene from Office those Space come to mind, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, I haven't actually watched all of Office Space, but I if Office Space did not like Mike, cover this particular event, yeah. then they absolutely should have. <laughs> Mike Judge was an engineer before he became a filmmaker. So that's that's the perspective that movie comes from and why I think it's so amazing is he lived that life, you know, and so yeah. 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 Bocus, you'd uh, half hardly cheer. Uh, you're you're in a conference room, you're eating cake. And it's it was so depressing to me. Like like on those days, I wanted to just put in my resignation, right? Because <laughs> I didn't want to be that guy. I never wanted to be that guy who got like a little gold pin for being someplace for that long. Nothing you know? of substance, <laughs> just just the pin. <laughs> Forget about a pay bump or anything like that or a title change I mean, even. <laughs> You could get you could get promoted and and you could get uh, obviously with promotions came pay increases and that's all well and good I suppose um, and and the respect that comes with that you know there's something to be had there you know there's something you know there's there's good things but man that pin that was like the most <laughs> like my boss actually so I, I'm. I may actually send him this episode because yeah, you should. <laughs> because, like, if this little thing makes it onto there, he'll crack we up. But viewers. my my old boss, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my old boss at Cat, he, uh, I, it must have been my five year pin. Okay, I got my five year pin, and I was like just, just complaining about it. Like, <laughs> this is the thing. I just, I don't want this pin. Like, why can't they get? good you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh so my boss he made me a t-shirt he said five years of all i got was this pin and it pointed to a little circle <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious yeah you absolutely uh, should great. share with that guy that 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 is a good boss i feel like that guy had a sense of humor about it at least and that's like super oh, man. yeah nigel was great i mean he that would during his time at the Pittsburgh Automation Center, which is, you know, the cat office here in Pittsburgh, uh, that was the best time. It was so much fun. We <laughs> we were growing super fast. We were working on amazing projects. And, uh, and we also just <laughs> had a lot of fun, you know, like the T-shirt. That yeah, was, that's uh, awesome. One of many examples of the awesome time that we had there. I mean, you guys are leaders in that, or were in leaders in that industry, probably still are. I just haven't looked at it in, in a few years here. But, I mean, I, that, you don't accomplish those kind of objectives by not having that kind of a subculture, I think. And I, maybe I'm wrong on that. But, I mean, I feel like, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here again. I want to be corrected if I'm, if I'm if this is disconnected and I'm speculating the wrong direction. But I feel like at one point cat must have been like like velocity robotics or like ska like they must have started out as a small business just because everything else is like joy mining too you know fedex and mcdonald's and every every company in the fortune 500 had to have at one point just been a couple of guys or, or a guy or you know like you know just just a small number of people right and so like uh, maybe i shouldn't say guy because it's not gender neutral but you know what i mean like and so well you know kind of assume for companies that are older than a certain age yeah, but yeah that's true <laughs> unfortunately but yeah that's you're right that's the history yeah. so yeah um but he, I, I guess through that through that growth you know you have to build a structure in order to you know maintain velocity pun not intended and then um you know i guess through that structure you develop a culture uh, that culture brings with it the inertia and that's probably where that yeah, that disconnect comes from. That's interesting. 
I mean, yeah, uh, I, I think for us, the the Pittsburgh Automation Center was really uh, a special place and a special time. Um, we were part of a advanced R&D group who was sent out to Pittsburgh to work with uh, Carnegie Mellon, to work with, uh, you know, the robotics community here. And so we were doing pretty cutting edge stuff, um, which was which was awesome. And also, we were a very small group. We started out as three guys. Oh, nice. And yeah, that's awesome. Um, and you know, by the when when I left, it was about thirty of us. There were, you know, it had grown obviously a, an awful lot. Um, it's incredible that you got that was that. Yeah, it was it was great, and it was cool because we had the, you know, we had the security of the big corporation, and you know, we we dealt with the culture of the big corporation a little bit, but <laughs> for the most part, we kind of got to do our own thing. And that was, that was powerful. That's and, awesome. you know, it allowed us to, you know, in, in my humble opinion, make pretty good strides while, you know, while that lasted. And um, I, I understand that, you know, after corporate restructuring and stuff that kind of changed a little bit. And I, I don't know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's better, worse, same. I, I really don't know, but, um, but nonetheless, what we, what I got to experience there was very much unique. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yeah. It sounds like an awesome experience. And, uh, I didn't realize you got to see it grow to that extent that you were there from three to 30 bodies, you know, on the team. I mean, that's, that's really cool. You get to watch a tenfold, you know, factor of growth, which means you guys were doing awesome stuff and the mothership fed you more resources to keep it going, which is, you know, I mean, that's what, what greater validation can you get? I mean, for, you know, doing good work, I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the I I'm not really sure what the original intention of that center was. For me, the the original intention for the first three employees was that it was a three year assignment, and it was kind of a <laughs> rotational deal. That you know they were going to send people out and you know bring them back. And uh, I don't think there's a single person that ever went back to headquarters. <laughs> after coming out here at least nice by the time that i left i don't know that that had happened um there you know there were people who moved on to other assignments uh in other parts of the world but um the the fact of the matter was that we had a really good time yeah <laughs> and I mean, there weren't a whole lot of people who wanted to go sit in you know a cube farm you know a thousand oh. By a thousand, you know. <laughs> I know the feel. I've I've actually turned down. I'm sure you've done this too. I mean, I've turned down higher paid jobs for like more interesting jobs. It's something I do probably more than I, I should. But I don't know. I love research and development, especially the development side of it. I love working on you know challenging problems. Like it just gets my blood pumping. And and I mean, there have been plenty of secure positions that I, I could have taken where, you know, it would be. I don't know, it would be a paycheck, it would be financially more responsible. Um, you know, it would be, but it just, I wouldn't have the same fulfillment. I was talking to an older uh, mentor, uh, maybe like a year ago now, and I I'd mentioned there was some research project that, that we were working on where I made what I perceived to be a rookie mistake. And um, it was like not hardening something against temperature or, or like, uh, friction or just something like some oversight uh, for a specific use. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I, I was kind of, you know, getting down on myself. And I remember saying like, Hey, is it, I mean, does that make sense that I, and he's like, dude, people make these mistakes all the time. You're, you're in the research and development phase. Uh, the whole point of research <laughs> and development is to make mistakes and learn from them, you know, so that you can, you can build product, you know, using the lessons learned from those mistakes. And I said, well, do you still make mistakes? And this is somebody that's, you know, been doing this for 40 years at 80 hour weeks. So they say they've been doing it for 80 years. I'm like, oh yeah, every single day. <laughs> In fact, the day I stopped making mistakes is the day I quit R&D. And for me, that was a really powerful <laughs> statement that kind of stuck with me. And I, I hear that sort of angel on my shoulder, if you will, saying that a lot now in my own head, you know, whenever I kind of feel like, you know, I'm, I'm spinning my wheels on a problem or, or something is, you know, perhaps a little more, uh, 
I don't know. It's, things don't always go right. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're, you're attempting to hit a goal, but you're, you're sort of in unknown territory. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to remember. I mean, not, you know, to the point of uh, delusion where you're ignoring, you know, reality and you're going down a dead end path indefinitely. But I think, you know, in order to, to conquer hurdles and, and development, you kind of have to make mistakes. And so to, to be able to recover from that, I think is key. So I don't, know. I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, look, yeah, if you worked at SpaceX for a while, I don't even know really what you did. That would be interesting. An interesting uh, it was, it wasn't that big of a deal, but I can get into it if you want. Well, I am, I'm, I'm a fanboy of SpaceX for sure, and their development of uh, their uh, whatever the big new rocket is called. The... Likewise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Starship, thank you. Yeah, um, Starship. Sorry, I, 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 instead of giving useful data, I'm like, yes, I am also a fan. <laughs> so, everyone who works there is. <laughs> and and you know, I watch the I watch the live feeds when they do launches and stuff. Which actually, by the way, I think today they're supposed to launch. I don't know, maybe they already did while we were you talking. But that's awesome. Um, the you know, there are a lot of things that Elon Musk does that are you know, awesome. And a lot that are not awesome, just like any of the rest of us, I suppose. Um, There's a lot that are, could be perceived either way too. You know, Elon was also such an interesting guy to work for because, you know, you mentioned that kind of stuffy conservative culture. It wasn't that, I mean, the chefs, uh, I, I used to work in food service when I was, when I was an uh, undergrad. So I, I was a, uh, I was a bus boy and then I was a, a line cook for a sushi catering outfit. And so I, there's kind of this camaraderie I get with people in foods. I considered it as a career choice when I, before I went into robotics. And um, anyway, I made friends with all the all the corporate cooks at SpaceX. You know that I that I had the time to talk to, and you know they'd bring me back in the kitchen and give me extra food. It turns out that um, Elon had poached a lot of them from the Playboy Mansion from Hugh Hefner, and so that was that was their talent pool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they would make things like ceviche and Korean barbecue. Like, you know, it was, it was a real cool culture. Then they had a coffee shop that I can't remember what it was called, but it was like some spacey kind of retro. Like it, it was neat. Yeah. And then that was, yeah. that was in the middle of the dining area. And then they had, uh, they had one of the legs from uh, the, uh, at the time I was there in 2013. Um, I just had an internship role. I, I was in IT systems because it was the one job they had left by the time I was able to apply. <laughs> And I, what it was is I had this pretender syndrome. I didn't think I was good enough to, to, to work there. And so I just didn't apply because I didn't want to face the rejection. And so I remember one of my friends uh, who I'm going to have on this podcast at some point uh, basically convinced me. And so he was like, dude, you know, just apply. You're, you're a really smart guy. Like, you should just, just apply. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to. And then SpaceX sent a bunch of recruiters to Pittsburgh, to Carnegie Mellon, uh, where I wasn't going to school at the time. I got a master's degree there since, but I had a lot of friends there and I was spending a lot of time with the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club. So I, I knew a lot of those people and I would kind of get tips when something cool was going on. And so this one was, hey, there's a SpaceX recruiting event. Come over to this restaurant. Um, it was, uh, I think, Luca on Craig Street. And um, you know, an open bar, you know, like they're, they're throwing down, you know, check it out. And so I, I went there. and. You know, they asked what I was drinking. I came in the door and they gave me, you know, one of those giant glasses, like like a 12 ounce glass full of vodka. And I'm like, okay, so it's going to be that kind of a night. And so I just <laughs> after, you know, I, I just got more drunk than you should ever get around, you know, prospective employers. And uh, I remember just having a great time. Like, I, you know, like these guys know how to party, you know. And, and so it shouldn't have been my motivation. But, you know, me in college was very different than me now. And that, I was just like, Therefore, this must be a good work environment. <laughs> and I think it still is important to put your feet up and be able to let go, but I don't think it should be the defining factor, you know, in, in a working relationship. Yeah, yeah. So again, that was just kind of my young naivete. And I, um, and I, again, I wasn't, I have no complaint. I enjoyed that aspect of the culture at SpaceX quite a lot, but um, that's, that's what convinced me to finally get over these hurdles was just getting drunk with them and, and deciding like, yeah, these, you know, it's like-minded. <laughs> And then I also remember, like, we sort of closed the place out. So me and my one friend who also uh, ended up working there, and he had quite, I think he was there six years, um, where I just did the internship and went back to school. Um, he, um, him and I were the last ones to leave there because we, we just stuck around and, and drank with these guys. 
And at one point it was the two of us and it was like four SpaceX employees <laughs> at a table. So we really got the, a good kind of intimate, you know, conversation going and, and, you know, talking about, you know, there, so I guess it was more than just drinking. It was, it was the openness that comes from when you're drinking with somebody. Um, and you know, at least, you know, I mean, I have a lot of anxiety sometimes. I try to hide it. So it's not always apparent, but I think, I think just being able to, to talk about, you know, that, that stuff and, and kind of hear, yeah, you know, like we work really hard, but when we have a launch, you know, we crack the champagne and there were strategically located fridges full of champagne, like around SpaceX. It, it was, it was kind of cool. And then people would tell stories. I, I, because I was only there for a three month internship, I didn't get to experience a launch party. <laughs> But that was, uh, I was so excited to experience a launch. But there was supposed to be one when I was there, but there were delays on that launch. And so, <clears> I, uh, <throat> you know, it's, it's all good. I mean, I, I, I would hear stories that I'm not going to repeat on the air about some of the debaucherous things that would go on at those parties. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically what you're saying is that when you watch a launch on the live stream and you've got all those engineers cheering, they're not really cheering for the launch. They're cheering for the launch. <laughs> I'm guessing it's both. So I, I, I would think that, well, so there was over a million parts in one of those rockets. I mean, there are so many, or at least there were when I was there. I don't know what it is now, but there's so many things that could go wrong. I mean, it's a miracle. Like, you know, I, I was talking to um, a colleague a while ago, uh, and just spec this is when I was in school, it would have been one of my professors, like colleagues, a strong word, but I, I was talking to a professor of mine uh, about computer architecture. You know, and he said, there's so many subsystems that had, I'm paraphrasing, he said, there's so many subsystems that have to work in order to make this computer work, you know, uh, that it's a miracle it works at all. And that, that kind of also stuck with me. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, working on robotics, I mean, there's so many different, excuse me, things that have to, um, to go right to make, make your robot turn. Now imagine that, but like on a, on a much larger scale where you're pushing the limits of technology, I mean. You know, I mean, just the rocket equipment, like how much fuel you can get in the space. I mean, and, you know, again, I didn't work directly on the stuff while I was there, but I think every SpaceX employee is a bit of a fanboy and, and you kind of get bombarded with this information. And so, I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I mean, it really is, you know, sort of an important goal for the future of humanity. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with them on all that stuff, you know, I, I and it, it is cool to see the, uh, you know, the Raptor engines finally being announced. Um, and, you know, the, you know, the starship kind of being, you know, kind of put out of the limelight. I mean, I feel like that was always sort of a neat goal. I don't have they actually started building it yet. I haven't been following perhaps as closely as I should be. So they today they're supposed to launch serial number 11. And that is the 11th full build of the second stage, the upper stage of the rocket um, of starship. They've got. Starship. Yeah, wow. they've got three okay. Raptor engines on. Yeah, nice. They've they've launched uh, three of three of them have launched to um, uh, what is it like ten kilometers or something? So it's a ten kilometer hop, and then they actually use their their flaps to belly to belly flop. You'll have to look it That's up. That's amazing. Really yeah, no, I'm going to be watching this, and, and maybe we can you know splice this in if we're not going to get sued. But, uh, we'll do a little <laughs> yeah. research with Google. It's <laughs> so public, and there's a gazillion YouTubers talking about it. So watch the YouTubers; they're way better than us, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, probably. About I mean, well, like I, I, I haven't worked there for a while, and I've, I've kind of, you know, how you work somewhere, you kind of, it's it, the relationship becomes a little different, you know. And so I, I don't watch every press release anymore. Like, clearly, not enough, uh, but it's still fast. I might get it, back into it because I mean, they're they're it's doing amazing stuff. Uh, one of the things that one of the approaches that SpaceX takes that was kind of the original point that got us down this uh, this rabbit hole, which is a great rabbit hole, by the way, yeah, I'm um, it too. is that, you know, if I think Elon Musk quote is something like, if you're not blowing up rockets, then you're not moving fast enough. <laughs> yeah, and, I think it was on Rogan. He said that I, I did see that recently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and that's. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, that's what you were talking about, right? It's, it's research. You're going to make mistakes. And if you don't make mistakes, then you probably thought about that way too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, 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 and especially yeah. at that echelon of technology where, I mean, it's, it's one of the most bleeding edge things being worked on, you know, and I know we've been building rockets since this, you know, the, 
I guess it would have started in the 40s, right, with, like, the V2 in Germany. I mean, I know it's not a popular, you know, place to credit the invention of rockets as the Nazis, but that's that's where it came from. Yeah, it's, I, other people yeah. were working on it, too, but, I mean, they were the first ones to actually, you know, come up with a product that worked, even though it was meant to bomb the British. And so, yeah, I mean, Werner von Braun then became a U.S. scientist, worked on the Apollo program. I mean, that's the, the guy that a lot of those people look up to. And so, I mean, yeah, you know, it's uh, there's a great... Do you know the the guy Tom Lara? Like he makes like kind of funny songs. He was like a Harvard professor in the fifties, and he, he had yeah. a bunch. No, so not at all. <laughs> there, there's a song he has about Werner von Braun, and it's it's like in the style of a ragtime. It's like gather round, well I sing you a Werner von Braun, a man whose allegiance <laughs> is rude by expedience. They call him a Nazi. He won't even frown. Nazi schmazi says Werner von Braun. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, like you too can be a big hero if you learn to count backwards from zero in German or English. I know how to count down, and I'm learning Chinese. Says Werner von Braun. So I realize Chinese isn't a language, but those are the words of the song. So it's uh, it's good. I grew up with that stuff. Uh, I, I recommend checking that guy out. He's he's really like if you like that kind of humor, he's got some really good ones that are, are yeah nice. Not all entirely PC, but. Uh, I mean, it comes from a place of, of satire, and so I, I think it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But yeah, uh, anything else you want to know about that? Or I mean, I'm happy to to, to keep going. But oh, it's crazy. I'm hogging it. Too. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, man, I I know I I I can't think of anything specific. I mean, I would I would just like to like dig in around like their latest prototypes and uh that would be really interesting to do but but the thing is they're so they're so public about it and they're seriously like at least a dozen youtubers who just yeah. that's all they do pretty much talk about spacex and what you know they're oh, most sure. recent and then tons of fan art and everything it's just it's it's really kind of a cool community and uh and so, I mean, I'm not even really part of it. I, I'm part of oh, a you single. Are. No, you totally are. You know more about what they're doing these days than I do. I mean, yeah, but I like you're the first person besides my family that I've talked to about. It. You know, it's not like I'm part of the, you know, the Reddit's or you know. That's fair. Whatever. So <laughs> yeah. no, they're doing cool stuff. I guarantee you there's stuff that you and I don't know about that they're working on. That's that's probably in some ways even cooler than the stuff we know about. Because uh, I know there was when I was there. There was stuff I couldn't talk about. And, I mean, that was, it was just, you know, really, really neat. Like, I remember I got to sit in a, uh, a early prototype for the manned dragon capsule that they've since launched a, a bunch of missions on. And it, well, I don't think it was even announced back. Maybe it was. Like, I mean, no, they were public about the fact that they had, you know, a manned space program in the works. But, you know, it was like, yeah, I, I believe so. Like, I, I don't know the exact messaging, but I, I know that because Elon announced it in, like, company addresses. And just, just sitting in that, I mean, that prototype, I mean, and, and like seeing the Tesla displays that they've since announced are being, I mean, they were using the 19 inch displays from the Tesla, uh, would have yeah. been the, uh, the Model S, I think at the time. Um, and you know, they had three of those in, in the, um, in the capsule. And so, you know, you, it basically was on the third floor of headquarters. And so you could, you could just, you know, if you, if you had kind of been going on a task for like 10 or 11 hours and you just wanted to kind of clear your head. You could you could literally go and take a nap in the prototype for the man cat, or, or you could just hang out there, you know, and sort of be like, "This is why you know I'm, I'm working this hard is is because we're working toward this this goal," you know, and that's probably why yeah. they put it there. I mean, I, I mean, I, I would I would assume there was an announcement before I got there, and it sort of got left as a, I don't know this for a fact, but if I had to guess, that would be my guess. But I mean, it was like a really motivating place to be i mean you you felt you know like you were working towards something bigger when you when you sat in there so. that's that's really cool i mean <clears throat> that's one thing that i think COVID has been really difficult for me personally and i'm sure that's true for a lot of people is that being in isolation is um uh, it's even if you're a very self-motivated person um when you're in isolation sometimes it just you, you don't see other people working hard and like doing stuff, doing anything really. And like, I, for me, like 
even just driving into the office and seeing other people driving into the office, it's like, there's a certain motivating factor to that. It's like, Agreed. Hey, look, you know, we're all like, doing something. <laughs> and, yeah. and when you don't see that, it's like, ah, whatever. <laughs> I, I think people have shown that you can still get good work done, you know, working from home. And I'm kind of glad that, you know, employees in general seem to be getting granted that autonomy because I think it's probably good for mental health overall. And in some time, in some cases, I think it's also good for productivity, but you're definitely right. Like there is something to be said for going into the office and interacting with coworkers. And, and I think it puts you in a space where you're like, okay, I'm here to work. Let, let's get, let's get stuff done, you know? Uh, and yeah. so I, I feel the same way when I, when I, it's funny, even if I'm with somebody that they're not working on the same task, but they're still just working alongside me. Like, I don't know why, but I'm way more motivated. I mean, I just, I think we're social animals and just, it's we're like monkey animals, see, monkey yeah. do. I mean, I, I'm definitely a monkey. I mean, at, at least evolutionarily speaking, right? And so, <laughs> like, I don't know. I see somebody doing something, you know, like, like oh, that, that guy's working. I want to work too. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's so dumb, but it's definitely true. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's been there absolutely. for me as well. Yeah. I, there's a lot to that. And, and I think that's, that's been one of the biggest um, kind of things that has uh, biggest drawbacks, I guess that's what I'm looking for, biggest drawbacks of being totally at home. Look, I mean, when COVID started and everybody stayed home, it wasn't a huge change for me because I work most days from home anyway. Same. But there were, there cool. were some days when I didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, yeah, those kind of went by the wayside. Yeah. So how have you been dealing with it? I guess, like what's, what's been your approach to kind of conquering that challenge and, and you know, how do you, how do you get through the work day? Well, I mean, how have I, how have I done that? I mean, really it's, it's the same thing that I've, I've I haven't really changed anything. Um, there's a, I think there's a certain aspect of getting your, environment set up a certain way and having your coffee or your whatever like there's making the space inviting for work you know there's a lot to that um and that is helpful but i have found for me it's not been uh not been so helpful that i don't find myself having days that are less productive because of it and i think my my productivity has suffered i mean i i say that and that, that is true, but also I have a tendency to not tie productivity to time. Exactly. You know, I think, well, so it's task output or is it a different metric you use? Like what's your, how do you, how do you, well, it, it's entrepreneurship is by, at its core, it is a creative pursuit. And absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, big part of creativity is being able to make informed, good decisions, <laughs> being able to, um, being able to, uh, see, being able to see and understand the situation that you're in and be able to react quickly to the changes, be able to, um, get back up quickly when you're knocked down. Um, it's it, it's a lot more about choosing what is the best thing to do as opposed to spending a lot of time doing not the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> doing something that's not, I mean, I would rather spend an hour doing the right thing that's actually pushing us in the right direction and making a difference versus 16 hours, like <laughs> spinning, my wheels, right? I mean, yeah, I think we all, would. and, and, and yeah, of course, I mean, that's, that's obvious, but unless you're trying to run for down me, the block like, for, you know, like we talked about, <laughs> earlier, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, I suppose there are certain situations, but if you're you a business owner, like, that's not your positioning. I mean, you're, you're not going to stay right. alive if you've got that mentality. And, and I don't think any rational human is going to function that way. I might be wrong, but I don't know. No, I got, no, you're right. You're right. And, and the thing is that, um, you know, you need to, you need to make sure that the right things are being done and you need to make sure that the person who is the best person to do those things is doing them. And 
you know, sometimes that's you, sometimes it's not. Um, <laughs> but I agree. In, in any case, like that's that's been my struggle is is trying to figure out the you know, trying to figure out how to put the proper values on the proper activities and making the you know making the best decisions that you can make. And one thing that I found is that I need a certain amount of downtime and I need to be well rested and I need to like it's it's better to be in a positive mental state and uh, be able to make good choices than to be burnt out and you know it's so easy going do. down yeah and it is it's very easy to do and that's you know that's been uh, it's been part of my struggle and this this past year for me i mean mental health wise has not been my best it's know? it's been that and, for the entire world um and so yes, yeah exactly there's, exactly there's no and, shame in it ever and, but especially now i mean just because there's so many people experiencing it yeah exactly Myself and for included, me you know, yeah yeah and for me part of that has been you know the struggle of getting a business up and running because basically sb monitoring which is my primary focus right now um we started it really started doing it full-time in january of 2020 nice and so you know the vast majority of its existence has been, you know, through COVID and it's been trying to figure out stuff that's new to me, new to us, you know, new to company, yeah. but also new to the world all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, that's, that's how you get a value prop. So, but... and, uh, and so, you know, there have been the struggles with cash flow and everything that I talked about earlier and, uh, in addition to that, struggling with the fact that I had to put Velocity Robotics on ice has just been really difficult for me. And I've had to focus a lot on, on mental health, just getting past that that slump, you know, that yeah. de depression slump that came after that. Same. And, you know, I have, you know, I've, I've uh, been working with a therapist who's been really helpful. I've been working with a coach and... Nice. Um, you know, I've been able to get through that and that's great, but, uh, I've also had to like rebuild the infrastructure that I use to like manage my time and manage my, <laughs> that's awesome. All that, you know, all that stuff. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, I've come out, you know, with a better system. So interesting. I've been, maybe I'll back to work all that. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know when you, whenever you need to restructure like that, I feel like, you know, it's, it's difficult to do because you, you want to keep moving, you know, at a million miles an hour or however fast, you know, you perceive your company's momentum to be. But, you know, you sort of have to sacrifice productivity, at least temporarily, to restructure like that. And, and it's challenging. I mean, I know I've grappled with that as a business owner quite a lot where I, I just feel like to put things on hold even from, I mean, I remember feeling like, you know, kind of somewhat burned out. It would have been like around like November, December of 2020. And, um, you know, I went into the pandemic with, you know, kind of at a sprint. I mean, you know, we had, you know, as, as you know, like some, some, you know, you know, decent size for us projects going and, um, you know, pumping money into R and D stuff. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of stuff at once. I mean, I, I think that's kind of a coping mechanism for me a lot of the time, not to, you know, kind of cheapen it from a business perspective. Cause I, I don't, this is, maybe the R and D project was a little bit um, misinformed, but I, I mean, you know, the, the stuff for customers. I mean, that was you know, that was fulfilling and, and it achieved the goals that we were trying to get done. But um, yeah, I feel like um, you know, I went from that that just full sprint to you know, like ah, oh, this is kind of killing me inside in some ways. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I just thought that I should I should take a couple weeks off. And I remember. F it took me three months to find a couple of weeks off. So I, I just took two weeks, like, like two weeks ago. And so, or a week ago, it was, it was like one or two weeks ago. And, um, you know, I just, I didn't want to cancel any meetings cause I, I still have this, you know, kind of sense of, of duty that doesn't allow me to do that. And so, you know, I, I basically found a gap in my schedule and was like, all right, I'm taking it. And so, uh, I'm glad I did. It, it was, it was, you know, really, really nice to just kind of, you know, 
take a little bit of time off. Um, maybe what I did wasn't the wisest. So I, um, I, uh, I don't even know if I should announce this, but I can always edit it out. So I, um, what I did is I, I decided to, uh, to go to Texas because I, I know that they're less restricted down there. And so my mentality was, um, I've never really been to the American South. You know, I, I, you know, fucking Jewish person from, you know, the, the mid Atlantic <laughs> region. I spent most of my life in Pittsburgh. I floated around like Boston and New York, like, you know, very much a Yankee. And so I, uh, <laughs> basically, you know, I wanted to see how the, how the, you know, I just wanted to see what it was like. I've heard good things about Austin and, you know, that the fact that they, you know, they had like concerts and comedy, you know, going on that I heard about, and, you know, really good barbecue. You know, I, I, I still, you know, kind of took precautions while I was there. I, um, I remember on the way over, I stayed in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, and then it was like a little bit too cavalier, like at the point where I was like a little worried. So I remember getting a rapid test in Houston just to make sure I wasn't going to be putting people in Austin at, at risk, you know, when I was, you know, inevitably, like I came into contact with somebody even masked up, right? You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, that that's kind of where my moral compass leaves me. Like, I don't want to hurt other people. Like, I think I'll survive this. And, you know, I mean, you know, we, we had pretty much everything handed to other managers. So like, even if I got horribly sick, like it wouldn't have screwed over any of our customers or anything like that. But like, um, you know, I, I basically, I just didn't want to put anyone else at risk. And so when I got back, I waited a week for the full incubation period. I got, you know, tested and, and it was negative. And then, you know, it's like, okay, back to limited contact with, you know, very few individuals on an as needed basis until, you know, I get vaccinated. So actually I had my, la yeah. had my first shot yesterday. So, so no, no, to look forward to. Yeah. yeah. I need to actually look at that. I, I have not, uh, scheduled anything yet, but I tell you what, I was on travel in Florida. You talk about Cavalier. <laughs> I've um, heard they're pretty, pretty it, masks off there. It's like, it's like the virus never existed there. It's, uh, I, w I went into a Walmart, which is a terrible idea. Um, I had my mask on, you know, whatever. I was trying to social distance, but the thing was cram packed. It was a super center, and there had to be a million people in there. Holy, that's like that. I feel like that's almost like going to an exhibit, like from the future, about like what what the past used to be like. <laughs> Man, it was crazy. That's how I felt. I went in there. No, I mean, like half the, half the people weren't wearing masks at all, and. You know, I was like, I was giving them glares. Like I was just <laughs> glaring them. Of course, they couldn't see because I had my mask on. Nice. So, you yeah, know that's I mean? good. That's, that's the best of both worlds, I think. Because you get to have your feelings, but you're also not offending the person right across from you in a way that they aren't going to act on. And so, you know, I, I felt that way when I was in Nashville. Like I, I very much so... I, I don't love going to touristy areas, but I ended up on Broadway, which is like where it's a famous street and I'll probably get some, some, some pushback for this, but I don't like it. It was all cover bands and it, it yeah, I wanted to see like some young musical artists that hadn't been discovered yet or, you know, just like, like people kind of really doing their own art, but everybody was like doing a Guns N' Roses cover because that's what tourists want to see. And so I finally, I, I went to like a bunch of these places and it was like guys from Alabama that just were not, you know, I, I don't mean to throw Alabama under the bus. I just talked to a guy that was from Alabama, you know, while I was in line for the restroom and I, I was fully masked up. He was not, but you know, I just tried to try to be civil and, you know, keep a bit of distance. And so, but yeah, you know, I that's, I want to socialize. So I get to know this guy. And so, you know, he'd been there for a bachelor party. Um, he was, and that seemed to be the trend is a lot of people were like for some wedding or some similar event, they, they'd gone to Broadway in Nashville. And I think it's like the reason people go to Times Square in New York, you know, it's like, that's what people that aren't from that area know about that area. And so yeah. I ended up there. I uh, didn't, didn't want to be there. And then I remember just, there were so many people, like the density the people were standing next to each. It, I mean, it was like being in Times Square before the pandemic. I mean, it was you know, like, you know, shoulder to shoulder people. And even though I was wearing a mask, it was one of those dinky surgical masks that doesn't really do as much as you would hope. And I, I was kind of kicking myself for not wearing the, the N95 and, and we're going with that, you know, rinky dink half a mask instead. And so I, um, that's, that's when I got rapid tested as a result of that. The first time on that trip is cause I was just like, this, I, this is high risk behavior. I, I, 
I don't want to be getting other people sick. You know, I, I, I probably glared at a few folks under that mask, you know, without even realizing it. Cause I just felt like I wasn't safe. You know, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it will be interesting to see how, you know, after everybody's vaccinated and the numbers are way down and everybody's kind of back to their normal thing, how long it takes people to feel comfortable, like standing close to a stranger. Oh yeah. Um, you know, like the, the, the distance that you stand apart from somebody for conversation, is that going to be permanently or at least semi-permanent? It'll be, it'll be semi-permanent, I think. And I, I probably shouldn't you know, speculate like I know, but my, my guess is that I, I mean eventually maybe it'll go back but i mean you know how how are those sorts of social conventions set anyway you know it's a good point. um and so i i think there's going to be a lot of people who are really uncomfortable being probably around. some people will, will stay i mean i'll stay with all of us for the rest of our lives i mean we've been collectively traumatized as a species but <laughs> that's yeah. what it is but yeah I, I do think that you know I've suffered some trauma in my life before, and I don't want to go into the details on the air, but I remember coming out of it and, and just being, you know, really uncomfortable with hugging people. Like it was very difficult for me to get over that any kind of physical touch or it was hard. Like it, it was really, I was struggling inside and, and it took, you know, basically just going out and, and forcing myself to interact. And, and I mean, you know, obviously therapy as well. And, and there were a few other bits to it, but a big part of it was just going out to, to places where it was like socially acceptable to, you know, like, you know, get to know people and, and you know, give people a hug and, and just get some of that physical, you know, affection for lack of a better word. And that, that for me, at least I kind of opened back up to it and, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you've, you've interacted. I'm pretty quick to handshake when we're not in a pandemic or, or, you know, like, I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. give hugs typically to my, my people I work with a whole lot these days. Cause it, it you know, isn't, you know, where that's at, but I, I feel like at the same time, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it and like getting back into that. I, I think we will, I, I think give it a couple of years, but I don't know. I, 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 I suspect like, you know, we'll, we'll probably move. Back. I mean, maybe, you know, some people will sort of, be like holding down it. I don't think it'll be exactly the same as it was. I mean, we're probably going to see some stuff stick around, but I mean, I don't know. I think we're probably going to move away from like the polycarbonate and acrylic dividers and the, um, oh, I, I, but coffee in public, I think no one's ever going to feel comfortable doing that again. Right. Like if I had to guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, or it'll take a while, you know, it's, uh, but it, you know, if, if everybody before the pandemic, typically stood apart by two feet. It would be interesting to like, and this is totally not measurable, right? <laughs> so this experiment is impossible to complete, but it would be interesting to see if that average distance increased by a few inches or something. There's gotta know? be some way you can you can measure that. I mean, like just looking at surveillance footage. I mean, it's a little creepy. I guess you can rather, but... Yeah, right, yeah. Take, take surveillance footage of, of, of one of those tourist districts, Times Square, and, uh, you know, look at it, you know, like, um, like, you know, at set intervals. I bet you could actually do that, like with some machine learning, like as, as you do in your work with SB monitoring, you, you yeah. could probably run yeah. that experiment. Just yeah. On retroactive yeah, you could. data, assuming someone stole that, which somebody does, like in a place like time, somebody retains footage that long. I, I can almost guarantee it. Surely, the New York I mean, even, Department. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a very kind of specific environment. But you know, you're right. You could you could find like a sample set of different environments, and and then do that measurement. You know, take the average, and it it would be interesting to see if there's actually a a change in the average. Oh, there for sure you know, would be. Uh, I would think. But then well, them going to Nashville. I mean, there didn't. It didn't seem to, like, I don't know what it was like before, but like, I mean, it's, yeah, but yeah like, that's a very, like, that's a very specific environment. There's, you know, a certain set of people there, you know, a uh, certain subset. So you take, you take Times Square, you take Broadway and Nashville, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you take, uh, I don't know, random, these are all very public places too, yeah. uh, but 
Yeah, I don't, I don't like know. Oxford I don't know Street, what London. I mean, you could you could go to just epicenters of different cities and, and look at you know distances, and it would actually probably be interesting to see the histogram geographically, like of like you know you could come up. This is so nerdy. And, look at like, it. This is how you know we're engineers. <laughs> look at art. Is you know we're you, just you, you could come up with a histogram of like how distance <laughs> different places are, or like a heat map if you if you put it on a globe. Like you could you could do some interesting stuff with it. And I'm not usually a big data guy, but I, I feel like in this case, it would be sort of fun to to aggregate and, and yeah. to look at that data. It definitely should be, you know, a an academic, you know, a funded paper. Oh, this the NSF would happen. pay for that. I mean, I guess you would have to know yeah. how to get that fine. I'm not, I've never been good at government grants, but. Like, you I'm, and I aren't the guys to do this, you know. But no, we're some not. Some professor. <laughs> You know, it'd be a sociology paper, right? Yeah, yeah, for so sure. I could see this discussion, this experiment being a Freakonomics episode. That's why it was, I don't think it was Freakonomics. I think it was uh, Radiolab who okay. recently did a uh, an episode on a, maybe it was, I don't remember. It was one of the two. They did an episode on octopus, on an octopus mother in like the deep like some deep sea trench you know off of the west coast and i didn't realize this but those animals have not really been studied very much at all wait really and yeah um interesting so like in fact that particular species they had not even observed uh they had not observed a mother like watching over its eggs interesting ever Till just you know the past five years or whatever. It was, not even like in an aquarium. It was real, like they just don't do it, like in captivity. Not in an aquarium. Um, and there are actually quite a few animals that are are like that. Because um, that wasn't the first. That wasn't the first uh, animal mating episode they did. <laughs> That's it. So, like, what are the what are some of the things an octopus mother will do? You know, when when guarding or eating and say i don't even know what the what the behavior is so yeah it basically defends its eggs against all threats and That's awesome. does that heroically um and uh and then as soon as the eggs hatch the mother dies wait just just instantaneously or like how does that even yeah, like I mean, since my job is yeah. done here i can let go of life it's kind of by the mentality yeah so we have this uh yeah with sb monitoring uh one of the things that we have done is we built these camera trailers they're solar power they have you know big solar panels and batteries and uh, you know that entire system and then they have uh pencil zoom ip cameras and some other equipment well like we have had, we've built a handful. We haven't built a ton of these, you know, it's still pretty new. Um, but we've built a few of them. And they, you know, it seems like a pretty easy thing to build. It's all off the shelf components. You know, you, you pick them out. There's not like a ton of engineering required. You just kind of put these things together and, um, you would say hope for the best, but you really expect the best because, you know, there's really not a whole lot to them, right? Well, <laughs> it turns out <laughs> that, that this is not how it has happened for us. Um, we have had, you know, an alarmingly high number of these camera trailers just disappear from the network and then we don't, we don't see them again. And we end up having to send a technician out or I having to go out or whatever. And I have, um, <clears throat> I have also taken to kicking myself about these things because, you know, it seems like a simple enough thing and, you know, geez, Elon Musk can send people to the ISS and here I am like struggling to get a camera working. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I don't think anything's a hundred percent bulletproof. I mean, you know, that's, one of the things you learn very quickly as an engineer or you know, even as a, as a business person, I think, you know, is, is stuff breaks all the time. And it's, it, I think it's how you handle it. There's uh, 
somebody I, I used to do business with who would say, you know, the person that cures cancer, and you might have heard this one already, but it's, it's the person that cures cancer is not going to be somebody that has no cares in the world. It's going to be somebody neurotic who is beating themselves up a little bit and is never satisfied and, you know, is, is just a workaholic. I, again, I don't know if that's the healthiest approach to have, you know, all the time, but I don't know. It, it, you might need it to get through certain hurdles. Like, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I absolutely think so. Um, you know, there's a, if you're totally satisfied with your existence, um, then, you know, there, there may not be a, uh, an impetus, a drive to do more. I don't know. That's certainly, I, I've never, it's a good analogy. I've never completely satisfied with my existence. So neither I can't <laughs> really. <laughs> so it that sounds may, like I felt really true. good, but I mean, that's, that's <laughs> fleeting, right? You, you have that moment, you know, where you're like, yeah, this is awesome. And then, you know, we, we did it. I, we I got, think... we got this, con- now we have to achieve it. You know, <laughs> like we, we sold this content. Yeah. Now we actually have to do it uh, back to work. You know, For me, uh, one of the things that I've learned and one of the things that really got me through my tough time last year was learning to like step back and actually celebrate, you, you know, your wins, even if they're small. And that's something that I haven't done enough of. Um, and I've, I've learned to do a little more now, nice. but in this, in this case with our camera trailers and the, the technical problems that we've been running into, um, you know, we've tried a lot of different things and we've ruled out a lot of problems. And at the, at the end of the day, you know, even though we haven't solved it yet, we know a lot more about every single one of the components that goes into those trailers than we ever, than we ever did before. Right. And, that's um, awesome. you know, what were I some know, of the, yeah, what, what were some of the early problems failure that we looked at? And yeah, how'd you fix them? Um, yeah. So at first we thought it was a power problem and we thought that the, uh, you know, it was, we didn't have enough solar panels and the batteries were dying, uh, overnight. And that was shutting the whole system down and then you know when it was funny again uh then they would come back up and so we added we added solar panels we added batteries and as i was sitting in the airport leaving the site after having installed those additional components <laughs> thing, i think i know where this is going but that out again i got it an email notification. I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's, a, it's uh, amazing how often that happens where, you know, you, you sort of do celebrate, I think in your head a little bit when you, when you tackle one of those challenges, you're like, all right, we beefed it up. Our power system's robust. We're not like, oh crap. <laughs> like, there, there it goes. <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad. And then uh, eventually, so we've been working with uh, the, the folks who sold it to the uh, the cellular routers on these things that's how that's how these connect to the internet and uh cool. we you know we tried upgrading the firmware we tried doing factory resets we tried um all sorts of things that they you know said that we should do to uh to, to fix it because what what we actually what we did as part of the solution is we put a raspberry pi on one of these things and, and wrote some software to uh, monitor the, you know, the battery voltage and the, and the solar panel voltage and stuff. And is that a watchdog or is, is a watchdog something? I probably shouldn't be asking such an elementary question in view of the world, but I think that might be <laughs> uh, called a watchdog. <laughs> like... I, I wouldn't actually call it a watchdog. It's just a basic monitoring system. A watchdog uh, would be more like watching for a certain condition and then doing something based on that condition I and see. we weren't we so, didn't have any sort of this it's half a watchdog <laughs> interesting yeah I'd, I'd be interested uh, in exploring the differentiator there but i don't want to i want to bore viewers too much but okay. <laughs> yeah but, it's okay but you're so, looking for a heartbeat you're looking for voltage you're looking for you know just yeah, this alive and then MP. intervene yeah. if it we is wrote that toggle relay yeah yeah and in fact we weren't even toggling a relay 
we, we weren't doing any sort of control. It was simply just monitoring what the voltage was and seeing if if we lost connectivity to the trailer, what was the voltage when that occurred? Because, you know, if we had solid power, then, well, we can rule out the power as, you know, the cause, right? Yeah, so the major diagnostic that's, move important. That's what we did. Um, so we were able to rule out that because we had great battery voltage uh, when some of these outages occurred. So we, you know, uh, the next thing to look at was the router. And um, it turns out that <laughs> several of the routers that are used in these sorts of mobile applications from different brands all use the same cellular module. And so this sort of occurrence is actually not all that unusual. I mean, it's, it's kind of unusual the amount that it has occurred in our case, but the uh, the the fact that this happens, like the support people that we've talked to with the supplier, you know, they're like, yeah, that that happens sometimes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it was, so it wasn't a brownout condition due to power failure. It was just an intermittent failure of the chipset on the cellular modem. It was just yeah. Although. I think maybe it's somehow tied to an under voltage condition that happens once, and then that somehow tweaks something ah, in so the router. Ah, like you lost some some kind of a bit or something in firmware, and and that. Yeah, or something. I mean, I, I'm it's, I'm not privy to the details of their uh, it's firmware messy. or whatever. So, yeah, it's tough when you're engineering something with a black box in the middle, and that's yeah. and that's kind of what we have. But anyway, a uh, little bit short, uh, we found a, another router that actually has built-in capabilities for managing uh, low power, low voltage situations. Nice. And has a bunch of other like uh, kind of power management stuff uh, awesome. built into it. So uh, it's, it's really kind of better suited to our application, I think. I'd be interested in using. learning who that vendor is, if you're willing to tell me at some point offline, just because that's- Oh really yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. it's, um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's uh, at this point, we haven't proven it for a fact, but we do have one of the new routers on, uh, on one of our trailers. And so we're in the middle of doing that experiment now. And- uh, Nice. I. So far, so good. It was installed yesterday, so I can't really enough. can't really say success yet. I was, um, by the way, the the chipset thing you mentioned is is I can relate. So when we were working on this podcast setup, I mean, USB is the culprit, right? It's it's not a very reliable communication medium. Uh, it's convenient. I remember when it first came out in like you know the early two thousands, late nineties, and. It was super exciting. You could plug in all your devices through this one interface and you know, it was cool. And then it matured. We've had USB 2, USB 3, multiple iterations of USB 3. And um, you know, it's it's all interesting stuff. Um, but in my experience, it's, it's not the most reliable. Like the fact that devices can connect and reconnect, uh, you know, due to like well-meaning power management features in an OS or like, it's just not meant to be, you know, an all day long industrial communication standard, um, you know, or even, you know, an all day long entertainment communication standard. And so uh, I, I might have mentioned this off the air, but I'll, I'll mention it on the air. So we're, we're going to switch the cameras in this podcast set up to a standard called, I believe, SDI. And so um, it's SDI. It's not the acronym I thought it was earlier. Um, and uh it's apparently what they use for like, uh, you know, like news anchors and stuff. And, and I'm kind of excited, but anyway, so one of the things we tried before that was to, to fix the USB, uh, card. We, we pulled out the USB three card that was in this computer. So this is, this is like an older server grade workstation that has a beefed up USB three card. And, um, we had one, we were running uh, from a very reputable vendor and, you know, it had like, you know, good ratings. It was just an Amazon purchase, like pretty basic stuff. And then, so, we ended up buying one that was um, like four times as expensive, you know, just thinking, well, we'll just throw money at this. Maybe that'll fix it. And so um, it had the same chipset. It was the same exact, the same driver, the same chipset. It was just more than one of them in the card. And so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, 
and so we're just going to move away from USB next. Uh, we'll see if that works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of fun. It's the same yeah. exact issue, right? If you abstract it away. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's interesting. I mean, USB, I mean, gosh, all of our mice and keyboards and stuff use that all the time. You know, uh, webcams and well, webcams aren't necessarily known for being the most uh, uh, reliable. reliable. <laughs> but okay. mice and keyboards, like, when was the last time you had to, like, reboot your computer or whatever because your mouse or keyboard wasn't working? Oh, absolutely. I, it, I believe it's tied to, and this, I might be speaking out of turn here, but I believe it's tied to throughput. So, I mean, the amount of data you got to send over the, the, the pipe, as it were, to, to communicate video or even audio, I mean, at, at you know, a high uh, degree of quality, um, it, it's so much more than, you know, the amount of data like a keyboard or a mouse has to crash. I think that has to do with it because, you know, you're not bottlenecking the bus as much, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Or just because, I mean, we've been messing around with some other sensors, too, that are USB based and... It's just not a great technology for sending large amounts of data. Like, I mean, that'll maybe change with USB four if we stick with it. I don't know, but you know, like right now it's uh, yeah. not as reliable as I would like. Can you imagine, like, if there was like an industrial USB, like, a, like a, I don't know. I mean, it, it's got a, I know and it sort of exists because we've got USB cables that have like thumb screws on them for certain sensors, but I don't know if it really exists. Like, I don't know if like. You know, you're putting USB into like thirty million dollar assembly line setups. You know, I, I, I don't think so. My my gut would tell me that would never happen, but that could be. Yeah, wrong. I don't. I would imagine those would use some other. If they're going to use some serial format, it's going to be like Modbus or something. Yeah, or I've seen like you know. like a Cognex module with like an RS two thirty two modem that'll. Uh, sorry, four eighty five. Yeah. That'll uh, that'll send that over. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's that's exact. So the the charge controller that we use for our solar uh, power system is uh, it has an RS four eighty five output. Nice. And then that so that's how we're able to we have RS four eighty five to USB. So there's both. Uh, that's awesome. Burger that we're, you know, we're plugging that into our little Raspberry Pi for our yeah, monitor. That, that thing probably so. doesn't have RS-485. I <laughs> looked recently enough at them, but <laughs> that's a good I mean, you can get an RS-485 hat for it and oh, it'll yeah. use some of its IO pins that will, you know, will take that in directly. But I don't know. If, if we decide to go with this monitoring system on a more widespread basis, then we'll put a little more thought into the architecture than just uh, throwing a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that so. approach. Like, you know, I mean, it's it's like you said, you want to spend resources on the right stuff. And I mean, that sounds yeah. like the right amount of effort to be putting in at that level on that problem. You know, it's like, let's let's get it diagnosed, yeah. you know, and then if this is ongoing, you know, let's let's beef it up. So I, I think that's yeah, wise. Yeah, exactly. You, you get to a point where something works, and then you work on improving it from there. But <laughs> yep. getting it getting it to work, just do its basic functionality, especially when you have a paying customer who's paying you for that thing to work, which that is, is certainly the case for us. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, that's that's kind of important. <laughs> no, I agree. And I mean, it's funny because a lot of times I feel like from the customer's perspective, like with stuff we deliver, it's always worked, but it's not the case when you look internally and you pull back the veil. I mean, like the reality is, I mean, there's there's no getting around the fact that like to, to solve difficult challenges, you're going to break things. And, you know, it's 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 not going to work in the lab the first time. Put it that way. Like, you know, it might work the first time the customer sees it, but it's not going to work the first time your engineers power it up, you know, at your facility, you know, privately behind closed like never like ever in the history of anything worth doing has that happened <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah and people will claim they get it right in the first trial the time but what you don't see is the tries they didn't tell you about or show you and i don't know i mean maybe that's a little controversial but that's been my observation well that's it's just that's not that's not how engineering works <laughs> not how building have you, know you ever fallen the just... trap though of like well, I think we talked about it. Like you, you feel like it should because I think that false expectation we set. 
And so, yeah, it yeah. totally is. It's a, it's it's completely unrealistic. And you know, I think I think for us or for this particular thing that we're working on, these camera trailers, you know, I thought that this is a simple enough thing that you know it'd work. There's not that many moving parts to it. You know, we we weren't super careful about every single component getting it exactly right. But, you know, we found components that you you would typically use for this sort of application and we went with it, you know. And in in our case here, you know, you could say, well, that kind of bit you in the butt, not putting all that, you know, not putting extra effort into making sure that the specs were right. Well, maybe, but I think that would have taken, like I always say, you know, <laughs> if, if you have to rely on clairvoyance to, uh, you know, to have an insight into something or to, to, <laughs> to know the right decision that, or, you know, if you have to be able to actually predict the future, yeah, have a crystal ball or whatever, then it's, it's not a realistic expectation to put on an engineer. And I mean, there's, so, there's definitely middle ground was, there. So, I mean, there is something to be said, I think, for like running the analysis or looking at the data sheet or doing a little bit of math before spec. But I'm sure you did that. You know, and so, you know I mean, I, I have no doubt in my mind you performed that due diligence and, and you still had issues because we all do. And so, mm -hmm. like, I don't know. That but you, you know, you, you choose one of the, you know, in this case, there are really kind of three manufacturers of the type of equipment that you would typically use for this. We chose one of the three. Nice. <laughs> and, and probably two uh, use the same chip set, or maybe they all do it. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. Apparently they all choose the same same chip set. The one that we didn't choose and we we didn't, you know, we didn't know that this was the case. Uh and, and in fact we wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have even been able to say that, hey, you know, um, noisy power supplies are going to be an issue here. And and we think that that may be part of the problem. We think that uh, because of a couple of the other components that are on, you know, on the same uh, power supply, we may be introducing some extra noise into, uh, into, you know, our power supply. And so if that's the case, uh, it just turns out that this other router is better at handling noise than you know, the ones we were using. I buy that. And, They've got uh, those kind of power management features and filtering. Something that we've had had okay luck with is is putting in through our power distribution boards, like a, just a degree of isolation and filtering at that level. I, I don't know if that'd be helpful, mm -hmm. but uh, something to consider if, if you want to go that route. Well, and that's certainly something that I've thought about. Um, we, I, <laughs> we haven't even gotten an oscilloscope on the thing yet. Fair enough. Uh, and and <laughs> that'll tell you a lot. Have... It's something that it's it's difficult to make time to do. But once you, you you, I'm one of those guys that like my whole career I've been like you know just let's try it and see what happens. You know, up until like very recently where I've started to take like maybe a little bit more of an analytical approach. And the truth is somewhere in the mm -hmm. middle. Like neither one is totally correct. Like if you're 100 percent empirical, you're repeating past mistakes ad infinitum. If you're 100 percent analytical, you're not doing anything. And so, you know, there's, there's a middle ground there, I think. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, yeah. Pontificating. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. So, I mean, it, it may make sense for us to put a filter in there, even with the new router that is better at handling the noise, or maybe we find that, you know, the new router ha handles that noise so well that there's not, really not any problem. Yeah. And, and like we've got other components on the system that are not having any, of these same issues so i don't know we'll see i i uh i actually have an extra camera that i ordered so i can i can build a, a test system and i didn't have nice. that thought of, but i didn't quite have everything that i needed to do that so now That's i've got it I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that oscilloscope on it and see what's up that's awesome. I, spe I feel like especially when you're doing stuff with remote setups which everybody's doing during COVID, and you know i think you'd have to do anyway with a company like SB Monitor and even without a pandemic, mm -hmm. I mean, to run it efficiently. Um, having a duplicate set up in the lab is, is awesome. And it, it's such a, such a great thing to do. And I, I can't, you know, applaud that, that enough.
not, not to be like weird or patronizing. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm going to use the, the test rig quite a bit, I think. So, yeah. Let's see that. It's, it's an ongoing well. asset. I mean, you're, you're investing in, you know, like keeping your customers up time, you know, where, where it should be. So nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think we're at like a pretty good stopping point. Is, is there anything you want to plug uh, while, we're, while we're still on? Anything you want like people to go to or see uh, if they've made it this far through the podcast? <laughs> if you've made it this far. I mean, just uh, check us out at sbmonitoring.com and you can see, uh, I think we've got some pictures of the camera rigs that we're talking about, uh, see some of the interesting things we're doing. And, and really, honestly, the camera rigs are like the least sexy part of what we're doing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a platform. It's, it's a means to an end. It's a platform that provides uh, camera footage remotely where it's it's otherwise difficult to put cameras and um then you know we're doing analytics and security monitoring and a bunch of other cool stuff uh with the video once we once we have it on the internet so that's awesome stuff um honestly great having you on the podcast thanks for coming in and uh let's let's try to do this again sometime yeah sounds like a plan awesome take care